Hello, and welcome to today's webcast, brought to you by Intelligent Aerospace. Today's event, Addressing Security in Safety Critical and Mission Critical Unmanned Aircraft Systems, will be presented by Dr. Robert Dewar, President of AdaCore and sponsored by AdaCore. Before we begin, we wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your audience console are multiple application widgets you can use. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can click on the Q&A widget and submit your question. We will try to answer these questions during the live Q&A portion at the end of the webcast. If additional resources have been provided for this webcast, such as a PDF of the slide deck, it may be downloaded via the resource list widget that looks like a green folder at the bottom of your screen. If you have any technical difficulty during the webcast, please click on the Help widget. It has a question mark icon and addresses common technical issues. If you still need assistance, just type your issue into the Q&A widget and a member of our webcast support team will work with you to correct the problem. For your convenience, this presentation will be available on demand within 24 hours of this live event. A reminder email message will be sent to all registrants with a link to the archive. It will also be accessible from our homepage at www.intelligent-aerospace.com. Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Robert Dewar. Hello, thank you all for um, uh, joining this webcast. Um, so I've been asked to talk about um, uh, security issues in uh, UAVs, and, and really for me that's safety and security. One of the interesting things I think that's happened uh, in recent years is that s the safety and security really have merged as concerns. I mean, a safety critical system is one in which people can be killed if there's a bug in such a system. If it's hacked, is obviously uh, at risk. And equally, you know, ultimately most, especially in the context of UAVs, uh, our security issues, a lot of them are focused uh, ultimately on safety. So, so really the safety and security concerns merge. Now, I, I come to realize some of my earlier presentations and articles on this really folk, I, I guess I had my software hat on, and I really focused uh, solely on the issue of certification of software and reliable software. But, but um, as I look at this issue more, I realize that it's really a, a hugely complicated issue covering um, so many areas. I mean, to start with, UAVs span an extraordinarily wide range of devices. Um, uh, you can buy tiny toy helicopters with small cameras aboard from Amazon. There's even a store just opened up in Las Vegas that sells uh, nothing but uh, drones. Uh, I think it's called the drone store or something like that. Um, there are more serious surveillance devices that are used, for instance, for surveying uh, purposes. And um, uh, or, or for um, surveilling farmland. I mean, there are a number of applications where it appears that UAVs can enormously increase uh, efficiency, um, all the way to true aerial photography. I mean, if you think of someone like Google um, populating their Earthview information, it must be very attractive for them to think in terms of uh, large-scale un unmanned drones for that purpose. Um, Transport, package delivery, very much in the news. Amazon uh, just recently got permission to uh, start testing their package delivery um, drones in uh, the United States. And in Switzerland, the post office announced that it's uh, testing and intending to deploy in the near future um, UAVs for the purpose of delivering mail to rural areas. And then we have large wing planes that are flying in commercial airspace. It's really a completely different uh, sort of dimension to the problem, all the way up to full-blown war machines with missiles, which are you know, familiar to us in the news from other purposes, but present their own uh, uh, extraordinarily complex security and safety issues. So if we have such a wide range of use, we're going to encounter a very wide range of uh, regulations. 
The small surveillance drones doesn't concern those worrying about commercial airspace, and and you know the FAA isn't insisting that the toy helicopter in your uh, in your local store be uh, DO 178B certified. But still, clearly, there's a regulation needed from a privacy and safety point of view. On the other hand, large wing drones flying at high alti altitudes in commercial airspace definitely do concern those worried about general aviation safety. Um, in some cases, uh, you can imagine a single device flying in different airspaces with different regulations. Imagine a package delivery drone traveling in normal airspace but landing on someone's back lawn. So when we think about software, and, and that is ultimately you know, my, uh, one of my primary concerns, we have to have in mind this wide range of concerns. And um, uh, these are going to be, in some cases, very complex systems um, which are going to really challenge what, um, uh, what we can achieve and how we can achieve it at a reasonable cost. So if we look at the safety considerations, there's a very wide range of uses, so there's a very wide range of safety considerations. Um, small surveillance drones don't threaten commercial aircraft, but they sure can threaten people. Um, recently, this is uh, six months ago or so, and last summer actually, a, race, a contestant in a race in Australia was taken out by an unauthorized camera drone hitting him in the face as he neared the finish line. And um, it's interesting you know, to think about an event like that because, um, you know, if that little drone had totally reliable certified software, I don't think it would have been even slightly relevant to uh, uh, the problem, which was um, an unauthorized, incompetent uh, journalist um, operating a drone that he didn't know how to operate safely. Um, Certainly large-winged drones flying at high altitudes and high speeds definitely threaten commercial aircraft accidents. No serious accidents so far, partly because the use of drones in commercial space is very restricted. I think uh, and we're all aware that the FAA and in England, NATS, the corresponding uh, uh, similar organization, have uh, tried to insist on um, such devices being very restricted, having very controlled uh, software certification standards. But even, even then, we had a near collision reported some months ago and uh, a real scare. I mean, a, a near collision is uh, luckily no one is hurt, but a near collision could have been a real collision. And, um, you know, I think one thing to consider with the safety of drones is that there, there is tremendous psychological impact if there's an accident caused by a drone. Uh, even, even though the loss of life might be... Uh, not so great compared to the loss of life on our highways every day. I think the psychological effect would be huge. I mean, you can see a similar sort of effect if you think about autonomous cars. Even if autonomous um, cars are much safer than ordinary cars, if one is involved in a serious accident with loss of life, it will have a huge psychological impact. So um, I think in practice, you know, we need, if you're someone like um, Amazon, uh, planning to deliver packages by uh, using a drone, one single accident could have absolutely catastrophic consequences for the future of such a program. So you really have to hold yourself to safety standards that are extraordinarily high um, in this kind of uh, environment. Now, if we look at security considerations, uh, really... Um, you can't, as I mentioned earlier, you can't consider safety without considering security. If a device can kill someone because of a bug, it can also potentially be hacked to deliberately kill someone. Again, the wide variety of uses means a wide range of security concerns. Um, corruption or destruction of surveillance records to full-blown takeover of a military drone. Um, some time ago, Iran claimed to have achieved this in one case. Facts are far from clear, but just the claim is worrisome, you know, to, to debate whether um, such a thing might be possible. 
Such phenomena of successful GPS spoofing have most certainly been demonstrated. And really, it's the last bullet on this slide that is most significant. One of, the, one of my um, uh, questions that I was put to me sort of in thinking about preparing for this um, webcast was, can drones be hacked? Well, can UAVs be hacked? Well, uh, from a purely technical point of view, what do we mean by hacking? We mean um, affecting a system from outside, in the worst case, taking it over completely. From a purely technical point of view, the UAVs are being hacked all the time. It's how they work. They are being taken over by an external radio signal, and um, that radio signal takes full command of the uh, capabilities of the uh, UAV. Uh, now, we can't, um, the most reliable security method is always to close the door. Um, for example, I think um, many of you may have read about the instance on United Airlines last week, which uh, worried about someone with a laptop computer hooked into the Wi-Fi system of a commercial aircraft managing to influence its avionic systems. Now, I think those concerns are probably overblown, but the kind of way we uh, address those is to make absolutely sure that no one under any circumstance can possibly send any signal uh, by Wi-Fi from the cabin that can possibly have any effect on the avionics. We can build a, uh, a completely secure wall, and even if, you're, even if you're the head of Boeing software development and uh, you have all the passwords in the world, uh, and you're sitting back in the cabin, you can't do anything because that wall is there. Obviously, in the case of um, uh, UAVs, we can't build such a wall. We depend on the ability to control these uh, devices remotely. Now, that, that really introduces a complete, um, the extra level of concerns, because we have to make sure that the protocols we use for communicating with UAVs um, they don't just have to be reliable from a software point of view. They have to be provably reliable from a security point of view. And uh, that means uh, using uh, strong encryption that we can really uh, rely on. It means also, and this is always something to consider carefully, it means thinking about how we protect that uh, that, that information, that critical information of how you communicate with these, uh, with these um, UAVs has to be protected. And that's more of a human problem than a purely, um, uh, purely software problem. And you know, the extraordinarily unfortunate uh, airplane crash in Germany uh, a couple of weeks ago reminds us that we have another very worrisome dimension, which is how do we ensure that the people who are authorized to operate um, uh, uh, UAVs are um, reliable, and what do we do if we uh, encounter the problem of a, uh, of a rogue operator? You know, and it's interesting to think that if we build, let's suppose we build a system with amazing quantum encryption, nobody, you know, provably no one could possibly hack this encryption. Uh, the strength of a chain is always its weakest link, and very often in these systems, the weakest link is going to be a human link. Um, very interesting book, incidentally, I can recommend is Secrets and Lies by Schneier, and um, I, I, I recommend that to anyone who's concerned with security and safety issues. Schneier is a uh, cryptology expert, and he starts that book by saying, well, you know, all that nonsense I wrote about secure cryptographic systems is misleading because the real weaknesses in many uh, secure systems are not the encryption or the technical devices. They are the people involved and the kind of um, infrastructure that's built around those people. So if you're in a position of being responsible for the end-to-end -end security of a, uh, of a UAV system, you can't avoid thinking about those issues. They are, um, they, they are important issues that, that uh, definitely cannot be neglected. Now, what are the software implications of, um, 
of uh, this rather complex um, set of security and safety concerns, um, as well as the fundamental uncertainties that I talked about um, in introduced by the very fact of remote control. In remote control always adds um, uncertainty. I, um, I, one of my other concerns has been the security of, and safety of car systems, especially you know these fancy computerized cars. And I read an interesting um, story that Tesla, one of Tesla's adjustments to the car was to deal with pro possible battery um, uh, uh, battery ignition problems was to raise the height of the car slightly and that was done externally by Wi-Fi pushing a Wi-Fi signal oh that made me <laughs> that put the whole set of worries into my head that if uh, Tesla can make your car ride a bit higher by broad shining Wi-Fi signals at it what can other people um, by accident or by nefarious intent do and uh, so any time we have this kind of remote control, it raises huge concerns and um, uh, really uh, taxes us at the very limits of our knowledge and technical ability to make sure that such um, connections are indeed secure. And because of all these considerations, the software for UAVs may very well end up being considerably more complex than traditional avionics software which has a really much more restricted domain. I mean, we, first of all, we've been dealing with such systems for decades. Um, planes have a rather sort of very specific thing. They take off from a runway at an airport. They climb into the air under the control of air traffic control, and then they fly uh, to their destination and reverse the process. And it, it's a fairly well-defined problem compared to the uh, myriad of problems that uh, UAVs uh, may have to face. That's not to say that it's uh, not a complex problem, but it is interesting to notice that in the case of avionics, um, I made this claim for, for a while now, and no one has ever contested it, so I think it's still uh, valid. We've never lost a life on a commercial airliner due to a software implementation bug. Um, We've had some very close calls that have been hair-raising, but we've never actually lost a life. And that's a pretty amazing uh, track record and, and reminds us that it is possible to build uh, complex software that is reliable. Although, as I say, we're, we're, build, we're faced with UAVs with building very sophisticated software systems that must behave in the same sense, absolutely reliably. And I'll go back to my point that um, it's extraordinarily important to avoid even a single accident with unmanned uh, aircraft because I think the public will, um, in some objective sense, massively overreact to such an accident. I mean, people, people have a sort of innate fear of machines taking over things and um, we could easily feed that with a, um, ac uh, with a serious accidents with the UAV, and, and we have to consider that in, the, in our sort of overall um, uh, perception and dealing with the problem. Me. So, a lot of the discussion has focused on whether um, UAV software should be subject to certification. Um, for instance, the, the um, certification standards that we've used for commercial aircraft and increasingly for military aircraft for some time now with some considerable success, the 0178 B and C. Certainly, this seems a minimal requirement for large drones flying in commercial airspace. Um, but it's unlikely to be uh, sufficient. And there, there are two regards in which that's true. First of all, for small drones, of which you know, I estimated uh, recently that we might have 10 million drone pilots uh, in this country within uh, five or 10 years. And they've, you know, because anyone can buy these things in a shop. And um, among that population is going to be some percentage of people who are incompetent and some people who are um, basically nefarious. There's a news story from last week. I can always find a news story 
from the last seven days that, that uh, 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 speaks right to these concerns. Someone landed in Japan, um, an unmanned, a small unmanned um, aerial drone on the roof of the residence of the Prime Minister and it was loaded with radioactive material. Nobody was hurt, but it's a reminder that um, you know, we, we face a real danger from those kind of events. And you know, it's quite clear that certification is not an issue there. It's not, it really doesn't matter whether the software of such devices is reliable or not because by far the bigger vector of unreliability is controlling operators. And we can't really address that uh, easily at all. Certainly can't address it in this um, uh, in the context of this webcast because it's a huge societal problem uh, needing uh, sort of every all aspects of society to wonder about how we can control this, how we can uh, deal with this. So the other thing that um, so to go in another direction, returning to this slide here. We have always to remember that certification is not a goal in itself. It's a means to an end. It's the end being reliable, safe software. Um, tier 178B is basically a testing standard that guarantees nothing from a formal point of view. You know, if you talk, if you talk to formalists, they will dismiss uh, DO 178B on the grounds that it doesn't prove anything formally. But as pragmatists, we observe it works pretty well in the domain in which it has been used, traditional avionics, so we trust it. But it, it does not guarantee anything specific, and we worry about our historical confidence if we move to new domains. I mean, the, re the reason we think DO-178B is a good standard that works is, is that it's a good standard that has worked. But it's worked in a pretty limited domain, and as we push that domain to new areas, we don't really have the confidence of that historical perspective um, to ensure, you know, to, to really ensure ourselves that it will work. Building complex, reliable software is a daunting task. Even in the favored domain of avionics, DO-178B has certainly been helpful, but it hasn't guaranteed freedom from potentially disastrous bugs, and we have one or two cases of um, really hair-raising near misses, including the Malaysian flight, which um, they had to power down the engines at 30,000 feet and do a cold restart because of a bug, and they didn't regain control till 14,000 with a plane load of very frightened, but safe ultimately passengers. So um, we need to bring our software processes um, up to a new level of reliability. And in particular, you know, let me go back to my example of um, the uh, cabin uh, Wi-Fi system. I remember, incidentally, this, sit this concern being raised for the 787 at one point. Well, do, do we think it's really good enough to... Uh, test that furiously you know we've we've hired a bunch of hackers and we've sat them in the back of the plane and and they've been hacking away for 12 hours and none of them has managed to break into the avi avionics jolly good we can rely on it that's not really comfortable what we that's a perfect place where we would like to have a clear proof uh, in the mathematical sense that such interference uh, is plain not possible now, if you look at the um, formal uh, methods and formal proof uh, domain, at one time we got um, uh, very, ex very excited about proving entire programs correct. And um, but that proves impractical. And, and even if we could do it, it wouldn't be that helpful since we can easily have errors in specifications. Um, so... Uh, what, ca what we can do with formal methods is we can allow proof of specific properties of a program. Some of these might be at the um, uh, purely software level. For instance, we can consider proving uh, properties such as freedom from runtime errors, overflow and buffer overrun, and that's uh, practical today. The new uh, ground-based air traffic control system in England, IFAX, 
is formally proved to be such free of defects um, using mathematical proof uh, techniques. And that means that you know, we're not just reasonably sure that those um, issues cannot arise in that software. We are mathematically secure uh, in our judgment that they cannot occur. And it's a whole extra level of certainty. We can also uh, prove specific security properties. Um, I refer you to the Tokenir project. You can uh, find that easily by Googling for Tokenir AdaCore. Um, it, it's not a, actually an AdaCore project. Interestingly enough, it was an NSA project to show that generating completely secure software is feasible and affordable. It, it, Tokenir controls access to a uh, uh, restrictive facility by means of uh, biometric information like iris scans and um, um, a typical specific security property would be that someone who does not have the right biometric uh, information cannot pass through the door and that's a very well-defined property and in the case of Tokenia um, a number of such security properties are formally uh, proved. Um, so as we, as we focus more on uh, thinking about uh, proving programs correct and demonstrating them to be correct in a secure way, there are associated programming techniques um, which can be very valuable. Um, in particular, the widespread adoption of programming by contracts with preconditions and postconditions. That means that as part of your program, when you write a, a function or a procedure, you formally write down all the things that must be true before it's called, and then you formally write down all the things that must be true after it returns. And you know, they're much, these, are, these are much more um, uh, detailed than just English language comments because they can be analyzed, they can be tested at runtime is one, one view of them, or they can be analyzed as formal mathematical statements to be proved. We, we, if we can prove the preconditions and postconditions of a function, then we know that, um, the, first of all, there won't be incorrect calls to that function, and second, we know that um, the function will correctly behave in, in all cases. So those kind of programming techniques, even if they're not associated with um, using um, uh, formal techniques, can be extremely helpful. So let's... Uh, there are a lot of advanced analysis tools around. Um, we're not, you know, the, the whole idea of using tools to, uh, to ensure um, uh, the generation of safe and uh, secure software is by no means new. And um, I've chosen here some examples from AdaCore simply because I'm familiar with them, but uh, you certainly shouldn't have the impression that AdaCore is the only com company in the world generating such tools. Um, there are a wide uh, number of companies uh, generating such tools. So let, let's have a look in a bit more detail. Um, static analyzers are an uh, important class of programs that uh, look at your program and uh, analyze it um, at one level, they just try to find bugs, and you know any program that finds a bug automatically in a program you've written is a useful tool. Certainly, it's uh, much better to find that bug early on using an automatic tool than it is to find it um, much later in the development process, where it can be much more expensive to fix, or worst case, after the software has already been deployed where it can cause a uh, major problem. However, you really need to look at um, uh, static analyzers to ask whether they guarantee soundness. For instance, let's suppose that we want, to, um, we want a static analysis tool that identifies possible buffer overruns. Well, if we have a tool that says, oh, you know, my tool is very good. It, it will find 90% of, uh, of, po of possible buffer overruns in your C code. Well, the, uh, that's useful. You, if, if you have access to such a tool, and it's the best tool you have, by all means, run it early on in the development process and let it find bugs that might uh, um, get through the uh, process. But that 90% raises the huge and obvious question what about the other 
So if you're talking, say, in a certification process, a tool like that is not a useful part of the safety argument. You know, it, just, it just points out that you, in fact, have a, a number of possible serious errors which you have not addressed. So um, more useful tools, and it's actually a, a, um, a, a quality of co-peer, which is a tool we sell for analyzing ADA, and that uh, guarantees to detect all errors. So if you ask CodePeer to uh, detect possible overflows, it detects all possible overflows. Now, that will generate some false positives, which you will have to spend effort um, showing are safe after all. Um, a, a overflow can't possibly occur. Or maybe you will find that overflow can occur, and you have to correct the problem. But once you've gone through that exercise, then uh, you really can be sure that um, uh, the resulting program does not have an overflow, and overflows are a serious source of errors, so that's an important uh, quality. I should say that uh, for such tools, um, if you're thinking of them in terms, in terms of a sort of full-blown certification, you have to ask, well, how do we know the tool works? It claims it's uh, found all possible uh, cases of overflow. How do I know it's uh, working? And that's a very important question to ask. The um, uh, DO uh, 178B and 178C standards, especially the C standard, addresses that with the notion of tool qualification. And there's a very formal process um, which you have to go through and, um, and meet to demonstrate that with a sufficient uh, margin of confidence, um, you're sure that the tool is um, operational and safe. And, and we've gone through that uh, qualification for Copier, and I can tell you that it's a huge amount of effort to go through those qualifications, but it's uh, certainly an important um, element. Um, moving on from there, there are full-blown proof environments. Um, we have, at Adacore, we've uh, concentrated on um, a language Spark 2014, which is particularly oriented towards mixing proof and testing. Um, I, some of you might be familiar with earlier versions of Spark, um, which were really purely proof systems and uh, worked well, but they demanded that you start an application from scratch in Spark, which can be done sometimes. IFAX was done that way, but Mostly, if you go to a customer and say, we have this magnificent proof tool, and step one is to discard all the code in your library and start from scratch, we will not get very far with that customer because, of course, all real systems are very substantially based on legacy code at this stage. Um, we, we seldom invent from scratch. On the other hand, Spark 2014 has the capability of uh, taking an existing program and then saying, well, as we add new critical components to this uh, tool, then we can prove that properties of those criti critical components are correct. So we can do things in a sort of incremental method, proving some things and, um, and testing others. Notice that it's, it's interesting in a certification environment, proof becomes interesting if it can replace testing. And that's a little controversial. You have to really um, get confident in proof techniques uh, to have them replace uh, systematic uh, testing. But it has been done in some commercial avionic systems successfully. Um, the, uh, uh, the designated engineering re representatives, DERs, in some cases have been convinced to accept proof uh, materials in place of comprehensive testing data uh, materials. And of course, if, they, if everything is really working, the proof materials have the potential to be much more comprehensive than the testing. Testing is never comprehensive by its uh, nature. One of the things to, um, uh, to think about is that um, even if you're not in an environment which requires certification, there's a lot of techniques that you can look at in, a, in that kind of development that may be helpful. Um, I was once teaching coverage analysis is a pretty obvious idea. It says um, generate a set of tests that's at least sufficient to make sure that every statement has been executed at least once. And uh, going a bit further, you, every branch has been executed in both directions, etc. Now, 
simple coverage analysis seems like a good idea. Uh, you certainly have more confidence in a, in a line of code that's been tested once than has been tested no times. So you would expect coverage analysis to be in pretty wide use. Well, a few years ago, I, had a, I was teaching programming languages at NYU. And uh, that's professional programs, uh, programmers. It's a graduate course. And they're, they're all working on professional programming projects. And I asked, and I had maybe 100 people in the class. I asked, how many people in the course of your um, day job of programming use coverage analysis? And it was one out of 100. And um, that seems unfortunate. And you know, just to give an example, reaching back a few years ago, the disastrous AT&T bug in the long lines code that caused the whole long distance system for the country to go out for an extended period of time was executing code that had never been executed once, and it was C code that misused a break statement, typical kind of C error. And it had never been executed once, and, and it could never have worked even once, and it uh, blew up seriously when it um, um, unusual situation of failure caused it to be executed. So I think a, a good encouragement is um, to look at coverage analysis. Best co I think the a most attractive way of doing that is if you don't have to modify the source code. That's uh, the tool that we provide is really focused on providing full um, coverage even for the most uh, fancy levels of coverage analysis required by the DOD standards without a source, um, without source uh, modifications. But there are many coverage tools out there. I mean, just, just GCOV, the normal um, coverage tool um, that is distributed with the GCC system is a good step in that direction. And it would be nice to hear, uh, see those used um, more generally. There are also specialized tools to handle such tasks as worst case stack usage. Um, in in uh, our environment, AdaCore, we've always dealt with um, embedded multitasking applications where each task has its own stack, and it's quite important to make sure that no task exceeds its stack space. In, if you're running on Windows, you can just give every uh, task a huge stack and hope for the best. But uh, in the restricted embedded uh, spaces, you don't have that luxury. So I, I remember as a sort of person in charge at the time, I said, well, Go and look around. There must be tools for doing this sort of thing. And surprisingly, I discovered there wasn't really a convenient tool at the time. This may well have changed now. And so we set, up, set off to build our own tool, uh, Gnat Stack. And it's interesting to see that a lot of people have used it. It has been used. It's a qualified tool, and it's been used in certified environments. But it's also been used by a number of um, uh, customers building embedded code in environments that, is, um, that, that are not um, formally certified. But it's nice to know that uh, you won't run out of stack space. Because of course, running out of stack space is a typical example of complete disaster at runtime, which can uh, uh, cause horrible chaos. So, so um, coming up to the conclusion slide, UAV has really posed a formidable challenge to our ability to generate safe and secure software. And it would be a mistake, I think, to think we can solve this merely by requiring some existing certification standards, though such standards will certainly play a very important role. We really need to adopt latest state-of-the-art approaches, including the use of formal methods to address this challenge. And um, I think those generating UAV software at any level should be familiar with tools and certification standards. As I say, uh, as I mentioned, for example, even if you don't intend to do full 178B certification, you might consider requiring full coverage analysis. And the, actually, the 178B standard is not that difficult to apply. We, we work um, with one uh, company that's making an autonomous drone, 100% that, that, uh, um, autonomous drone that follows a uh, given individual around. It's really aimed at athletes uh, so that they can have this drone photographing them in some athletic endeavor automatically. Now, that's a <laughs> That's a fairly, as soon as something becomes fully autonomous, it's of course much more complicated software situation. And they are committed to doing a full 178B certification of that software. Um, 
uh, which I think will be a, a helpful um, uh, tool in ensuring that be a reliable device. But as I hope I've made clear from, these, uh, from this uh, presentation, by no means a guarantee. So I hope this has been um, useful in um, setting off some thinking about what the real problems are and how we can best address them. Um, there are many fields in which uh, the concerns for highly reliable software are coming to the fore now, medical devices, um, autonomous cars, and certainly UAVs are on that list. And um, as the sky gets more populated with these devices, um, it's going to take a concerted effort to um, keep us uh, safe and secure in that environment. So thank you for the opportunity to talk. Thank you so much. Now we're um, happy to entertain your questions. Dr. Dewar has, um, has promised to um, answer um, any questions you submit, so I invite you to do so. Please just click on Q&A in the bottom of your console and uh, pose questions. We do have several. Um, the first uh, is related to, um, they're referencing your slide seven. Um, and and it, if, if you could speak to the focus of DO-178B um, where it's, it's compliance, um, the focus is on compliance. Can you speak to that at all? Yes. Um, so if I summarize what's involved in 178B compliance, first of all, a starting point is a full set of requirements um, derived from the specifications. And, that, and then those requirements have to be broken down into low-level requirements. And just that process of producing a formal set of requirements, breaking them down into low-level requirements, often finds problems. Um, we, we, it's, it's often the case that specifications uh, can be the source of problems. Um, we, we know some examples of, for instance, of, of planes crashing because the software faithfully executed specifications which were deliberate but misguided in retrospect. So um, that process of breaking things down into low-level um, requirements is a very important one. And by formalizing it and making sure it's done end to end, you, you can find a lot of problems at that level. Then you implement those requirements and you generate a set of tests based on the requirements, not based on the code, but based on the requirements. And then you make sure that um, your, first of all, the tests all operate um, uh, properly uh, in accordance with the requirements and that they fully cover the source code. If you have source code, if you have a set of tests that fully covers the requirements and you have source code that isn't executed, that is suspicious. Something is peculiar. There's a missing requirement reflected in the code, which you need to investigate, or there's some junk code that's uh, ill thought out and shouldn't be there, or something. And so you have to go through preparing that case, uh, uh, preparing those tests, and showing uh, the full coverage. Then the most important thing is you present those to a human being. And I, I always think this is one of the strongest things in 178B, is that there is a designated engineering representative there whose job is on the line um, to, uh, in approving um, a safety case made under 178B and always has the capability of saying, well, I know you've met the letter of the uh, standard here, but it doesn't feel right to me. Um, I don't like, I, I don't, I'm not comfortable with this approach. Uh, um, do things this other way. And uh, that can be annoying sometimes, but it can also be a very important um, gateway barrier to um, making sure that these, uh, I, I think, I'm sure that in retrospect over the decades, the DERs have helped keep 178B working well um, by applying that kind of uh, gut feeling to whether the whole case is put together uh, effectively. Now, all, this, all that procedure is potentially expensive, but I don't know that it's really uh, expensive in the long run. I, I think we've all been exposed to these figures where finding a bug later on is hugely more expensive than finding it early on. 
And finding a bug after you've deployed a, a certified avionics system is incredibly expensive. And so the fact that you spend some uh, more effort uh, fixing things up front by getting certification standards might cost you more, but um, in the long run, um, it may save you huge costs down the line. Um, yeah, a good example of this would be um, we, we really don't know if the Toyota problem is or is not um, a software problem. Um, it hasn't been clearly demonstrated that it is. But on the other hand, if that we do know other cases of uh, car systems with bugs, and we can just imagine a car system with a bug that causes uh, multiple uh, serious crashes, huge expense involved, and it's not a surprise that all the car companies are furiously looking at formal techniques and uh, how to improve the quality of the software. Fantastic. Okay, another question is, um, how do sing single signal response designations work more or less efficiently as opposed to keyed responses? You know, I... I'm, uh, that's, that's a tough question, even, um, I think even for someone who's a, a real expert in the area. Um, I, I, don't, I don't designate myself as such an expert, but I, I suspect that um, in practice, um, both approaches can um, work successfully um, very much a case-by-case -case basis. I think it's probably hard to um, generalize a response to that question, although as I say it, it's not really my uh, area of expertise to, and uh, it's a very interesting question that I'm sure um, you know, we, it will be worth delving to in, into more detail in some other uh, context. Okay. Another one is, um, are small surveillance drones threatening uh, to commercial aircraft. How small must they be, knowing that some drones could be comparable in size and weight to some birds? That, as yes, you know, that's <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, and, we, and uh, jet engines do not like sucking up birds, although most of them are built to suck up you know, birds up to a certain size safely. And, um, and so there are um, you know, existing standards on what engines must be capable of doing. So presumably you could uh, use those standards, um, you know, what, of what size birds uh, engines have to be able to resist and what size birds windshields have to be res able to resist and so on um, to deal with drones. It's interesting, there's another news story. I always find these news stories uh, flooding my uh, inbox. Um, just three days ago, um, the airport authority at Heathrow okayed the use of surveillance drones throughout the airport. Well, normally small surveillance drones don't mix with uh, uh, flight paths of planes, but here seems to be an immediate exception. And, um, you know, one hopes that uh, in, in building such a system that they have uh, given some real concern to this, but um, it's worrisome for sure. And um, we, have had, we have had planes brought down by bird strikes, and um, we certainly don't want to replicate that with a small drone. So very legitimate concern, and, um, and one that um, I think has to be very carefully addressed from a regulatory point of view. Part of the trouble is you have a, a huge push here. You have the, the security police at um, Heathrow, I'm sure, are really excited at the idea of being able to fly drones all over the place and surveil the whole, whole airport um, from the comfort of their control room. Uh, whereas, you know, those worrying about the safety of passengers uh, might have a different take on it. And you, you definitely have that um, conflict in hand. It happens with police departments all over the place, in fact, um, uh, that police departments would love to have an uh, unfettered use of drones, and it raises all kinds of safety questions. Okay, another question is, any special technique or tool recommended for the uplink security insurance? other than simple encryption? Well, first of all, I think we probably ought to take the simple out of that and make sure that we're using uh, uh, very secure encryption standards. Um, I, purely, I suspect the actual link, the actual encrypted link, 
can probably be made pretty secure. After all, you know, when we sit on the Internet today, we are trusting um, uh, encrypted Internet tunnels, HTTPS, to be secure. And they are. I mean, they're not, they're not a weak point. People do not uh, manage to um, hack databases and so on by breaking that encryption. So I think the link itself is probably safe. You do have to worry. I mean, things like GPS spoofing are very worrisome because those have been demonstrated, and you have to be sure that somehow you can be, um, uh, prevent that from happening. But I, I do suspect, so I, don't, I doubt there are any very special techniques that are required there. Mostly, it's, uh, as I say, the weak links uh, in that are going to be, um, first of all, the devices themselves. You know, if you, if you manage to capture a, a drone, how much can you tell about the uh, encryption by uh, reverse engineering it? And second, the, the whole issue of security at the originating control end is one of our conventional security uh, problems, and we're not too great at that. I mean, we have, you know, we have plenty of examples of, um, of uh, security holes that have been pretty serious. So um, uh, I think that's a real concern. Um, but it, after all, it, it, it is ultimately, say, no different from the problem of uh, how do we ensure that pilots are safe and rel reliable, which um, is a tough problem, but is one we have to address. Another question, um, well, actually, too, um, is whether you've developed or you're aware of drone detection software, and by the same token, um, any backdoor methods to, say, have your, your own drone self-destruct? Well, that's an interesting question. That I, I really, um, I don't know of... I don't know of anything in that area, but there must be uh, work in that area. Of course, it's most likely that such uh, work would be classified military, at least at first, and, and uh, so there may be uh, uh, consider. I mean, I, I assume that um, uh, the U.S. military must have fairly sophisticated technology for drone detection, certainly in the... Uh, in the sky, just because that's such an obvious uh, threat. So, but I really don't know. I, I have It's not something I've uh, read about or, or researched. So another very interesting question. One of, one of the things that's always interesting for me about a webinar like this is it sets me thinking on many new topics too. So mm -hmm. that's an interesting, definitely an interesting issue. Another question is: Is there really secure encryption in light of new quantum computer methods? To break it? Well, um, that, I mean, certainly that's interesting. I mean, a, a full blown quantum computer is a fearsome device that can uh, break, um, it, for instance, I mean, you can easily do the math that it could break uh, the encryption on, um, uh, on the web. I mean, one of the interesting things in any encryption, in any encryption on the web is well, you don't want someone to break it now. How bad is it if they break it 10 years from now? And um, that's a real tough question, um, which uh, has to be answered in that context. Of course, here we're talking much more about um, breaking things in uh, real time. And um, it's, certainly, it's certainly a theoretical concern. I continue to think that that won't be the weak link in the chain. I would be surprised if, um, you know, for instance, I, it's very hard for me to believe that Iran brought down that um, drone by breaking the encryption uh, system on the control uh, logic. It seems to me more like, first of all, I, I actually doubt they did bring it down at all. I think it was just one of these accident happenstances, but if they did bring it down, I think it's more likely that they did it by GPS spoofing or somehow realizing that there was some element of the control that wasn't properly protected. But the encryption methods themselves, I doubt they're the weak link in the chain. I certainly think 
that it makes sense in this in this um, in this environment to be using the strongest, uh, most powerful uh, encryption methods that we can uh, uh, that we that you know, correspond to our state of the art understanding. That of course is not the same as the state of the art understanding tomorrow or or sometime in the future. But I think if we if we you know we dedicate ourselves to highly reliable encryption on that link, it's unlikely to be the weak link in the chain. Now, what can um, developers and engineers do in their digital workflow to um, avoid, um, um, you know, help avoid the, the problems that, that come with human in the loop? Well, that's, uh, that's a good question. I mean, I think um, uh, we need to be um, more oriented towards the use of tools that can help in detection. I mean, it's an, it's an encouraging thing that many more programmers are using static analyzers, you know, especially appropriate um, in C, where a static analyzer in C can find uh, many um, straightforward problems of vulnerabilities, since that's a language that, that is rather vulnerable in some respects, and static analyzers can help address that. And, and we've seen actually a number of, um, we have a number of customers who come to us looking at Copia because they have a directive from some government agency or, or some other uh, similar environment which directs them to use static analysis tools. So that seems an uh, important development. As I say, there are tools and tools there, but um, one of the things we did Sometimes these tools are being regarded as something that the QA will use separate from development, but I think it's important that they be an integrated part of the development process. Certainly that's our view with CodePeer. We expect CodePeer to be in the hand of developers, and we expect them to be running um, CodePeer analysis of their code routinely uh, to detect uh, possible problems. So, um, you know, similarly, um, I think... Uh, looking into coverage analysis and, um, and being aware of the whole notion of more, of more systematic testing, even if it doesn't get formalized to the point of, um, of uh, um, required by the certification standards is valuable. And I do think, I, I do think the use of preconditions and postconditions and contracts in general in code is nothing new. Eiffel has been pushing that notion for decades. Uh, um, it's reflected in the latest version of the ADA standard, which has full-blown features uh, that cover that capability. Um, I think other language standards will follow along in that. And anyway, even if you don't have a built-in syntactic feature in your language, you can always find some way to have the effect of preconditions and postconditions. And this can be very valuable. Not only does it provide you an extra dimension of runtime testing, but it makes you think about your code. And anything that makes you think about your code improves the quality of the code. Um, so if you really have to think about your code, say, well, what has to be true as I enter this function? And what do I want to guarantee as I exit? Those are important questions to ask. We should be asking them all the time. The use of contracts kind of forces us to ask them in a systematic way. So I think that's a very valuable um, approach for software developers to get used to. It doesn't require you to become a mathematical expert in proof techniques because it's a pretty obvious concept. It's just a slight, it's a slight shift in the way you think about um, describing and uh, characterizing the programs you write and their components. Okay, a question has come in about uh, the development, you know, um, unmanned system development workflow, where um, some older workflows are looking at adding security at the end. Um, should it be, should it be carried throughout the workflow? Start with security. I, I think yes. You know, that that's also almost a uh, a given. You, security is not an add-on feature. Safety is not an add-on feature. I mean, I think if you want to look at Microsoft's experience there of the extraordinarily difficult path they've had to travel um, by treating security as an add-on uh, capability rather than something that was built into the system from the start. And there are still, you know, we're still dealing with a system where you click on an attachment and your machine gets taken over. Um, something which would, a feature which would never have been there if security had been in the 
in the uppermost uh, mind of the developers to start with. So I do think security is something uh, that you have to build in from the start. It's really difficult to just add it on. Um, and, and, you know, that, I think we can draw from the world of mechanical engineering. You know, if, if, if I say I want you to build me a really reliable, you know, bulletproof, armored car, um, you don't go to the used car lot, buy an ordinary car, and start gluing armor onto it. You design from scratch. And um, I think the same has to be true of software. Okay. And now for the final question, um, it was, certainly we have a wealth of them, but we'd have you here uh, all day. But um, an important question. Um, let's see. I'm not only concerned with avionics, but also the security considerations of hacking the grid, et cetera. So how safe, you know, um, should these development tools be used not only for the avionics and ground control, but, uh, you know, well, nu nuclear facilities, et cetera? Okay. I mean, uh, absolutely. You know, I was focused today uh, by, by request on uh, uh, UAVs, but we have huge security concerns, um, uh, security and safety concerns with uh, medical devices, many of which uh, medical devices are an example where software bugs have killed people. Um, with robotics, with unmanned, uh, with uh, autonomous cars, um, with uh, nuclear facilities, with chemical processing plants, with electric grids. These are, we tend to not, you know, we tend to read every day, oh, uh, 10 million records got lost by this company due to a glitch in security. Never mind, we've patched it up. It won't happen again. We're very sorry, and uh, we'll help you avoid any identity theft that comes from it. Well, I have no confidence that these systems, that I, these critical systems that I mentioned, are built in some way that's uh, considerably more secure. And um, in fact, I, I, you know, I, I know from my knowledge that far too many of these systems are built um, without sufficient concern. It, they're enormously complex, too. A modern car has more lines of code than a modern jet and, uh, plane, uh, a modern commercial jet. And um, making that code reliable is um, a huge challenge. As I say, I really see the car companies now, um, a number of them who we work with, including Toyota, you can read some interesting press releases on their experiments with formal techniques, um, are really concerned. Um, in fact, one of our first uh, contacts with Toyota was we, they said, we want to build this uh, demonstration project and we want to prove it, uh, do full proof of correctness. Oh, well, we don't think that's very practical. Well, we're determined to do it. Okay, so we put them onto an expert in that area and they did an experiment where they did a full proof of correctness and um, very successful experiment, uh, actually. So, um, of course, it takes the time to change uh, Technologies, but it is in indicative of the fact that uh, yes, I think uh, we have to. I, I gave a talk in Birmingham uh, last year. It was called um, uh, "I'm as mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore." The famous quote from Network. And my thesis was: we shouldn't tolerate the idea of unreliable software. It's not acceptable for for our looking ahead in, in the way society depends on software. It's not acceptable for us to take the attitude that it's okay for software to be unreliable. It is not okay. We begin to really develop the techniques to make sure that we can generate reliable software, and uh, software engineers in all walks of, uh, of life have to be more aware of those techniques. Uh, good question to end up on, <laughs> broadening us out into a much broader domain. Definitely. Well, on behalf of Intelligent Aerospace and Penwell Corporation, I'd like to thank today's speaker, Dr. Robert Dewar, president of AdaCore, and our sponsor, AdaCore, for today's presentation, Addressing Security in Safety Critical and Mission Critical Unmanned Aircraft Systems. This presentation will be archived within 24 hours and can be accessed from the homepage at www.intelligent-aerospace.com. A reminder email message for the archive will be sent to all registrants, complete with a direct link to the archive. We thank you for joining us today and look forward to serving you with future webcasts.